All right, well, let's go ahead and get, get started um, with today's meeting. Um, as all of you know, this is the Workforce Crisis Task Force meeting, and it is a, a public meeting. We request that everyone turn their cameras on to uh, help us with that interaction and help it be more valuable for everyone. Everyone at this point knows how to use their mute button, so try to eliminate our background noise as needed. Feel free to add any comments or anything into the chat room. We'll try to keep an eye on when people raise their hands or any other visual cues you give. If I'm missing someone, um, please, uh, someone else, feel free to point it out so that no one um, feels like they're being ignored or doesn't get to get into the conversation. Um, all our documents are, are put on our website. If you need closed captioning, you go to the three buttons on the tool par, toolbar. Um, there's a turn on live captions button that you can utilize. Our guest policy is that all guests are welcome, but they do not um, verbally participate in our meeting unless there's a specific sort of technical assistance request of them. So those are sort of our rules of the game. I'm gonna go ahead and call attendance and then we'll get started on our agenda. Uh, Jason Abadili. I am here. Jeff Davis. I am here, thank you. Kim Houck. She's there, I saw her face. Uh, Kristen Henry. Good afternoon. Deborah Hoffine. Hi all. Debbie Jenkins. Hi everyone. Willie Jones. Good afternoon. Kim Kelly. I am here. Teresa Cobalt. Here. Pete Moore. Here. Rivo Mirnix. Janet Stefan. Hello. Bethany Toledo. Good afternoon. Gary Tonks. Hello. Jason Umstadt. I am here. Renee Wood. I think you might be stuck in the waiting room. Okay, let me check that. Uh, I'm not seeing anyone. Kim, are you seeing anyone in the waiting room? I'm not right, seeing well, anyone. I'm not, no. Okay, well, we'll keep okay, an eye I'll, out. I'll try to troubleshoot with her. All right, Thanks. she might just be a few minutes late. So um, our agenda for today, we're going to have some welcome and updates from Jeff Davis. I'm going to talk a little bit about our go forward approach now that we've been working together for several months. And then we'll have um, an overview of what's going on with the American Rescue Plan Act as far as the state of Ohio's uh, plans are, and then any other pending items. Our goal today is to make this a 90 min minute meeting and be finished around 2.30, but we'll see how the conversation goes. So that's the agenda for the day. Anything else anyone else needs to add? Seeing none, then I will um, turn it over to uh, Director Davis. Jackie, thank you. So again, we are very appreciative of people's valuable time. So thank you for doing that. I, I, I think the agenda today will be uh, worthwhile, I hope, and there's a lot in it. So let's just uh, jump to it, shall we? Okay. So I think I'm the first thing on the agenda. So first of all, I want to thank everyone. We've been working together for several months and almost everyone um, in the group at some point has reached out to myself or Kim or Steve Beha and sort of given us some suggestions about how to make our time together as productive as we can make it um, because everyone cares so much about the urgent nature of what we're uh, trying to achieve. Having said that, I think everyone has started to give us feedback that having every other week meetings is probably not generating the level of proposals we need or being the most productive use of everyone's time. So having listened to um, all of you, I would like to put this proposal forward for how we can move to working more productively going forward. I'd like to propose moving to monthly 90 minute meetings instead of every other week. Um, continue to use our time together for informational updates, but also to really look at proposals. 
and let people in that time in between work in small groups, ad hoc conversations, however makes the most sense um, organically to generate more proposals for the group to then consider at those monthly meetings. That includes, until now, DOD is, D has brought some proposals forward, but going forward, they would also bring proposals um, forward from their perspective and their discussions. We're not anticipating that any of these subcommittees be formal task force subcommittees. We really anticipate it being much more ad hoc, which is sort of how it has been formulating. Different groups are working together with they have shared interest to bring proposals forward. And that's how we anticipate it going forward. So we don't see DODD staffing any particular work group or generating any kind of official notes. So it's a little bit of what we've been doing, but giving us a little more time in between meetings for you all to generate any proposals you think are important as well as for DODD. And when we get together, we'll continue to work through those proposals as well as any other kinds of updates that come up in the interim. So that's what we would like to propose. Does that sound acceptable to most of the team? I see. Head I nod. guess, Jackie, this is Teresa. Um, I know everybody else is nodding their head yes. <laughs> I'm just going to say out loud some initial reactions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there have already been a number of outside ad hoc conversations, as you've said, that have not included right. any person with a disability, any family member. They have largely been provider coalitions or county board coalitions. And so I'm concerned about that is just my honest answer. And so whether we collectively agree that those ad hoc groups would include representatives fr from this group that represent all the different positions and or um, yeah somehow uh, it just seems like by the time we come together if all the other organizations have had a chance to meet and um, come to agreement or consensus on something uh, that either families or people with disabilities haven't had a chance to look at, talk about, be a part of the conversation. Over half the group has built consensus, um, and I'm not sure what that process will look like during the monthly 90 minutes. So, Teresa, this would be my answer, and then I'll throw it open to other people. If groups want to come together ad hoc and prevent, present a proposal, they are only presenting a proposal. It still has to be distributed to this full group ahead of the meetings for review. It still has to be fully discussed in this group to see if it becomes a recommendation of this group. So a proposal is not a task force recommendation. It's people bringing forward a proposal. So I don't think that eliminates the chance in our full group meetings for people to make additions, to object, to ask for edits to build on a proposal, et cetera. That would be my answer from a facilitative point of view, but I would welcome anyone else's or any further comment you want to make about it. Uh, this is Gary. I put my hand up, but it's hard to see on this. I'm sorry, I, Gary. I, know I see yeah, I know Kim and I have been involved as family representatives. I think Nate has been involved. So uh, I I know I've been on at least three subcommittee meetings so far. So I think there is family representation. I don't know that it's. I know I agree with you to some extent, Teresa, because I know there have been meetings I thought we should have been invited to as the ARC and and we were not. So to, to some extent, I agree with you, but I know I've been on three of them. So if maybe the process is more open about, hey, this committee is meeting, how, if you're interested, how would you participate? And Nate has his hand up as well. I think I largely just wanted to say that I agree with all of the above. I think it's important to optimize our time together and also optimize our time in subgroups to include a diverse stream of perspectives and really just communicating about 
when certain subgroups are going to meet. But I know it's a bit challenging, too, because I seem like I, it seems to me that some of the provider agencies gathered and and um, you know, have generated proposals kind of on their own, maybe to get and not proposal in that sense, but just to get their ideas out the way that they see them and then bring them forward to the whole group. But maybe there could be a, like a separate, smaller discussion after coalitions meet to have just more perspectives on certain ideas before we as a task force would consider a whole proposal. But I think that all of what is said is very valid. I think that we can think about ways to use our time together more optimally and ways to work more optimally in our subgroups and have a more diverse perspective. Thank you for that. And again, anyone can bring a proposal together. You don't even have to have a subcommittee. If you have a good idea or you're, the group you're representing on the task force has a good idea, you don't have to feel like you've had a big subcommittee conversation with the group. Anyone can generate a proposal at any time. Kim, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I agree with pretty much what everybody's saying. Um, the way I feel about it is I, I at least want an opportunity to participate. Um, and so when people, and, and I'm not talking about proposals, I'm talking about when there's information gathering, um, you know, or there's, uh, regional things going on or someone is um, pulling together uh, information that they are then going to use to present a proposal or um, to submit to the group as a presentation. Uh, I think there's certain things that it would be nice to have a heads up on prior to the meeting and that if there was conversations that went on in a small group that we be notified so that we have the option to at least listen in um, or or even actively participate. Um, I, I know there's been a couple of times where things have come up and I've felt like, um, you know, we were left out of the loop until and, and we don't hear about it until right then. And it's it's a little bit troubling because it's kind of hard to think about stuff on the fly sometimes and you need some time to digest it. So that would just be my thoughts. Okay, and I also want to um, pledge to you all that any proposal that came forward, we want to make sure you get it a week ahead of time to review, and that also gives you a chance to call people and ask questions. And I know that's not instead of what you've said, Kim. I just wanted to make sure it's like a both and. Anybody else want to um, weigh in? This is Pete. Um, I, I really appreciate the comments made. I, I think uh, in, in many ways, we at OPERA and, and also our discussions with OACB and the other uh, trade associations have kind of regrouped as far as how do we generate uh, ideas and how do we get them to proposal form. And I, I'll say from my perspective, it, it's never the intention to shut anyone out of that, but we have to come up with a strategic plan almost for every idea for, I know for our opera uh, workforce committee, uh, we generate the idea, we have discussions around that idea, then we talk about the people we need to talk to about this idea, which certainly would include people receiving services and families. And and that that is our plan, is, is right, right now we're regrouping, uh, taking a fresh look at, at priorities, and and then talking about who do we need to bring into the conversation and it's our intention to not bring people into the conversation at the uh, crisis task force meeting but prior to that to get their buy-in so once we get to the task force meeting I, I I would hope that we've had all the conversations got all the buy-in and heard all the opinions we we need to get before that moment uh, given our now that we have less time which I agree with, by the way, I agree with the monthly meeting. Um, but so the magic's going to happen between meetings. And part of that magic is talking to whoever we got to talk to to get buy in uh, before moving a proposal forward. So um, 
there have been discussions about ideas and we're just not, not quite to the point of who we loop in because they're not to that proposal stage yet from that's my perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, Renee had a comment in the chat about um, subcommittees that end um, and, you know, may not be included in another. And again, I think that's probably also the nature of what Pete was just saying about people come together to generate an idea. And sometimes you realize that idea after you talked it through sort of won't work and you let it go. And other times it builds into something the whole group talks about. But Renee, is there anything um, else you wanted to add so that I wasn't misinterpreting your chat box comment? Yeah, um, my point, I guess my point was, you know, queer communication and how to get involved in a sub group, you know? Because I've been wondering a couple of weeks. Uh, well, I, I don't know about what I don't know about. Okay. Nobody sent out any emails about do you want to be involved in this or even at the meeting. We used, we used to ask people if they wanted to be involved in the subcommittee, and we don't do that anymore, it seems like. So it's like, I don't know how, how to get involved. Right. So just to reiterate, I don't think we see DODD making these official idea generating groups or subcommittees where we would be sending out emails as a task force, but, or, you know, other communication to your point. But I think whoever's, I you know, sort of sparking a group to bring up an idea, I think that's a very important reminder to them. I see Pete has his hand up and then Teresa. Thank you, Renee. Pete? Yeah, and I, I on, on one hand, I understand the not getting uh, formal subgroups together. I, I do understand that. But I, I did propose, and as you, you know, we were talking, Jackie, you know this, and I talked to Kim about this, and I think the director as well. I did propose uh, four maybe areas that I saw kind of warming up as through our WCTF discussions. And this, this is how we've, we've uh, divided up our opera workforce work. And the four areas are how do we protect people through the crisis, the people we serve, and and their families. Uh, we have a rates and wages group. Uh, we have a what to do about where this crisis is the worst, so a hot spot group. And the last one is future reform, system reform considerations. So I only say this to say that um, those might be areas where we could see where members of the task force have some interest. So when ideas are being generated, this is kind of an advisory group. Uh, for example, if I'm sorry to use you as an example, Nate, but I see you see you on my screen. But if Nate was interested on in being on the, uh, you know, protecting the people we support through the crisis group, he would be a person I he he has interest in that. So if we generate an idea, I would run it through Nate to get his feedback on. Um, so they may not be groups that meet but maybe there are groups that have a uh, special interest in a certain area that we would know uh, we, we could go to for input. So for whatever that's worth it. That's, that was my thought. Well, I could certainly do that. I could certainly um, do an email and see if there are particular groups in those four classifications people have more of a knowledge base in or passion about and 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 post that i suspect everyone's gonna post on all four but um i can i can certainly follow up and, and do that so i'm completely fine with following up that way teresa had her hand up and then i see renee once in as well so teresa can i add jackie um just I, i'll still say this again and you said it in your introduction 
I think we can post and we can help you guys organize, but I still think it'd probably be best if they were more of informal, more informal groups um, that just give um, a report back to this group instead of having to keep formal notes and um, such, I don't, you know. Well, uh, and we the more, have a conversation about that, but the more detailed when you fill out your proposal submissions, the more detail you can put into that and the more you can sharpen those proposals um, into some specifics, the easier it'll be for everyone to react to and understand some of our proposals at the beginning. And it, it's totally understandable because we were all just getting started. We're pretty broad and vague. And so that sort of sparks a lot of general conversation that I think the group feels, where's that going? So I think if going forward, we can try to be much more targeted and specific with our proposals. And if it means there are three proposals within one sort of grouping, that's cool. But the more we can do that, I think the more it would help everyone feel much more clarity on what they were debating, what they wanted to explore prior to the debate, uh, et cetera. And that helps with not being so nervous about notes because then the proposal itself is a much more fully developed um, idea that you guys as decision makers can think about if you want to recommend or not. So there is my editorial comment and I'm supposed to be throwing it to Teresa. So back to you, Teresa. Yeah, no problem. I think, you know, maybe and Willie, I appreciate you. Um, keeping track of how much time we've spent on this topic and giving us time to talk about this. Because I, I think from the beginning, Jackie, when I saw the proposal form, uh, the first comment I made to Steve, and I can't remember, Jackie, whether I copied you or Kim on it, was that proposal form was not friendly to people outside of systems and providers. Um, it is not something, I, I actually was hesitant to even suggest another family member to participate because when I saw that form, there was no way um, it was something she would be able to fill out. So I guess I'm feeling a little bit like families and people with disabilities can attend the group and react to provider slash county board ideas and i'm wondering how we can make it more conducive to actually generate and um organize around an idea or something like that and so i'm i guess i'm asking this group to think about the fact that when um you're and and i get what I'm about to say. So not all of us on this call, some of us are, but not all of us um, representing families or family organizations or um, people with disabilities are paid to do this, have the same knowledge base or access to the same data or the same workforce tools. And so this process itself is a little bit skewed <laughs> um, toward the system. And so how can we level that um, or equalize voices or opportunities to develop proposals that would be meaningful and react to. Thanks, Nathan and Renee. All right, I mean, that's got me thinking already, so that's a good point. Um, Renee was up next and then I think Willie. Um, I missed the beginning of the meeting, so I'm a little bit confused about it. The subcommittees. Are you saying that the subcommittees are not formal committees of the task force and they just kind of generate themselves around proposal? Yes. So the notion was that. Really, this group is supposed to be looking at proposals and generating recommendations to the director. And there's been lots of different ideas about how we could break into different kinds of subcommittees. Um, but what's really been happening most for the most part are ad hoc groups or just individual members with their uh, representative groups are generating the proposals. And that seems to be working fairly well. When we've tried to do subcommittees in the past, everyone wants to be on every subcommittee and then it generates 
a lot of activity around formal notes, big discussions. And so the thinking was to let generations of proposals come from anyone on the group. And if people want to pull together three or four people to come up with a proposal or polish a proposal, then however you guys all feel it's best to make that happen. And then of course, any proposal, Renee, would have to be distributed to all of you as task force members at least a week before the meeting. So you have plenty of time to review it, talk to anyone you want to. And any proposal has to come back before this full group to decide if it's a recommendation of yours or not. So we're not yeah. that was sort of the idea. So now that I know that, now that I understand that, the people who are generally little groups among the public, I think we can share that people with disabilities, family members that are included or is it all professional people? No, it's not designed to be all professional people. It's whoever you all pull together. So, for example, you could start a subcommittee to work on a proposal as well. So it's whoever wants to generate a proposal. And at the beginning, Renee, you're right on track. I think Teresa initially brought up trying to make sure that even in these sort of ad hoc groups or even if it's one or two people getting together, if they can make sure that the voice of individuals with disabilities or families are either included or thought through before a proposal is put to writing, that would be the right way to go. Does that make sense? I think Willie had his hand up next, but yeah, okay. Willie? So, so I'm thinking about what attorneys, Teresa and Renee said, you know, maybe part another path to this is having, um, families and people impacted by the, the crisis identify these are our issues and these are our current concerns and have that so that it's something that both county boards and providers can look at as far as ways to respond to that so we can truly hear what are those frustrations concerns and fears that you have so that when we look at proposals it can align with meeting some of those concerns and needs um, but uh, but I think it's more than just doing our uh, concerns and, and have the professional solve them. We need to be included in the extra discussion of what being proposed. It's one thing to tell, uh, tell somebody our concerns is the medicine to be included in the discussion of how to solve that. And again, any proposal comes back to the full group. So if someone puts a proposal together that others on the group feel is not appropriate or misses the mark, then this group has every opportunity to voice those issues help refine a proposal or say, no, we're just not going to be supportive of that. So everything has to come back here for, for discussion. And as you know, we've been voting whether or not to recommend something. So none of that would change. Nathan? Yeah, I definitely appreciate all of this discussion. And I, I would say that as OSDA's representative, we did send a letter to Mr. Davis earlier this week, um, and we are willing to have some sort of a town hall event to really focus on the perspectives of individuals and families in this crisis and maybe even have an ongoing series of events to get more of that feedback. And to Teresa's point, um, I, I mean, some ideas are coming in my head and I'm happy to talk them through with the department a little bit about if there are some good ideas and people just aren't quite sure how to fill it out and turn it into a policy proposal, how we could maybe offer some technical assistance there. So if, if, it's, if you guys are comfortable, I'll work offline with them to see about a couple of ideas of how 
if you've got some good ideas and for whatever reason the form doesn't feel comfortable, we could help with that. I think that'd be great, Jackie. Thank you. Because we don't want to lose good ideas. All right. Any other discussion about this? All right. I really appreciate your feedback. And again, the goal is not to um, lose a sense of urgency about the work or to let this somehow not be a priority. The goal is just to be as efficient as we can be with all of your time. So, Jackie, do we know yeah. if we're going to maintain the fourth Wednesday as the monthly meeting? Well, I was just going to get perfect timing. Okay. Nate. You were just going to talk about that a little bit about um, whether it's smarter to actually go to the second, because if you look at the fourth, we start running into a lot of holidays. Um, we start running into Thanksgiving and Christmas and some other holidays. So it might make more sense to use that second Wednesday of the month. But So that would be November 10th and then December 8th, which should also be on your calendars. Because otherwise we are literally the day before Thanksgiving and December 22nd, right of the week of Christmas. So if any, unless someone has a big objection, I think we were thinking about going to the, using the one that we blocked on the second Wednesday. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. And we will modify those Outlook appointments and send those all out to you and take the ones we don't need off the calendar. So we'll try to avoid calendar confusion and get those all sent out to everybody. Or Jackie, I even have another question before we completely move on. And I know we spent yes. a lot of time on this. I know that we have had occasionally presenters come. Maybe we could save a few of those yes. fourth Wednesdays for engagement from presenters and the outside community to come and talk about various issues and things that's needed. Just an idea. Okay. And we maybe can keep a few on the calendar. And if we don't need them, we can always cancel. But they're on there if we need them. So... I'll work with um, with Kathy, who's been generating our um, Outlook appointments to make sure that all gets cleaned up and out to everyone. Well, why are we going to lunch at night? Right now you have blocked, uh, we're gonna go to one meeting a month, Renee, instead of two. So right now you have the second Wednesday of the month and the fourth Wednesday of the month. And we were proposing going down to a 90 minute meeting on the second Wednesday of the month. I'm real curious as why we're doing it if, if we're in the middle of a crisis. The idea was to use that time to generate specific proposals so that our meetings could be more focused on ideas we want to move forward or not and less just general discussion and more these are the ideas we want to move on and look this is a fluid group if it comes we do this for a couple of months and we're all like we need to do something different i think that everyone in this group is game to being flexible and we'll pivot again so maybe we try this for the next three months or so, and then we'll see where we're at. And of course, if there's ever anything big that comes up and we have to do a, set up a new meeting, we'll do that. All right, thank you guys for that discussion. I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate all the offline conversations and emails people have sent with ideas about how to make this the best group we can because everyone is so passionate about the problem we're trying to solve. So I want to turn over to Jeremiah Wagner. He's going to lead us through um, the ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act, and where um, where that's at and what DODD can share about those federal monies at this point. So Jeremiah, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jackie, and thanks, everyone. Um, and there's quite a bit of, if you saw what um, Medicaid submitted, um, on the 19th and what's on their website. There's a, a great deal in that narrative in Excel. So there's a lot of content. I'm going to try to move relatively quickly through it and leave some time at the end. So um, Jackie, if you can kind of help monitor that, um, but do appreciate the chance to go through this. Um, you know, we, we submitted that initial plan uh, back in the summer and then solicited a lot of feedback um, through a state survey. 
And so today, looking to kind of continue that conversation with you and provide a little bit more detail on what the state plan is. Um, again, if you saw that Excel sheet, um, it's really light on details. It really is just project titles, and so it leaves a lot up to interpretation. So I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to hear sort of what we're thinking and where we're at in the process. Um, and again, I'm not going to pull up that Excel because it is pretty um, just tech heavy or sorry, text heavy, um, but we can certainly share that link in the chat if, if folks haven't seen it, um, but it is available on Medicaid's website and we did communicate it through our um, newsletters. So I wanted to start by, um, I will share my screen for just a couple moments, sharing um, some of the survey results that we received. Um, so just give me one second. And so what we did here is, again, Medicaid um, and on behalf of the, the sister agencies um, sent out this statewide survey um, to, to gather feedback to, that um, incorporated into this updated plan. Um, and so I, I think there was nearly 500 surveys in total. Um, a large percentage of those were focused on the DD system. And so that was extremely helpful for us. And so what we did is we took those surveys and we drilled down to ones that did mention um, kind of our service system. And you'll see the, the numbers fluctuate between, um, you know, 400 to 900. That's because people could select multiple options. Um, and so I thought it was important to kind of start with who um, responded to the survey um, and then what were their areas of suggestion. Um, so as you can see, we had a pretty good um, breakdown um, and cross um, our system with the major or the highest percentage being paid providers, but did get input. Um, but kind of across the spectrum. And then from there, um, we initially had these much larger buckets. Um, and then as you saw in the narrative in the plan, um, we did break it down um, and consolidate it into kind of four major buckets. Um, and again, um, with this, there's a pretty good spread there. And, you know, if you start to combine the things that are, um, you know, pertinent to this group and workforce, you know, the strengthening of the workforce and the immediate support and reimbursement, um, you know, that gets to, you know, 40, 50, 60% of the, the total, um, but then still um, good amount of input from um, supports for people and caregivers and families, technology, um, and some other improvements that are um, kind of across systems. Then next, I wanted to share, um, which if you were um, Medicaid hosted a webinar for some of the stakeholders um, before they submitted the plan. And so this is some data from that. Um, and it's also, again, available on the Medicaid website in PowerPoint format. This shows, um, again, kind of the breakdown of where the money is coming to in those four buckets that we kind of landed on, which is that immediate provider payment relief, um, technology, um, further workforce supports, and then kind of a catch-all um, for a lot of the other things that were um, submitted to the survey. And so as you can see, the, the largest um, impact is at 49% with that immediate workforce um, provider payment. Um, that state match um, goes a long way um, because that is eligible for um, typical Medicaid reimbursement. And then additionally, as you saw in the narrative, the goal is to get that out by um, March of 2022. Um, now that is um, definitely the, the latest that we would want to do that. Um, the reason that that data is in there is so we receive that additional 10% uh, federal match. Um, but the intent with that payment is um, hopefully CMS approval moves quickly. Um, hopefully we will get um, legislative um, appropriation and language here shortly. Um, and so as those things move, um, this will certainly be number one on our list um, to get out the door. And then I will 
um, stop sharing my screen. And again, I'm going to kind of flow through the Excel sheet, but it is um, a lot to digest at once. So I will um, not pull that up at the moment. And Jeremiah, can I just double check with you? Where did you say, uh, and of course we can post it for everyone, where did you say that the Excel spreadsheet could be found? Yep, and give me one second, copy, okay. and Medicaid posted um, the narrative, um, the plan, um, which is the Excel sheet, um, and then the, the webinar PowerPoint slides. So that um, last slide was from that webinar. Thank you. I just wasn't sure if you said Medicaid or OBM, and that's why I wanted to check. So it's at Medicaid. Okay. Who knows what you said? Yeah, I could have said either, <laughs> frankly, um, but it's on Medicaid's website. Um, and so from there, um, I, I do want to walk through kind of those bucket areas um, going a little bit out of order. But so we focused on the, the provider relief and then kind of staying on the, the workforce um, to in that second or the third bucket, which was um, workforce. Um, there's kind of two components to that. Um, it's titled a strategic fund, which is over $200 million. And the idea there is I would lump it into two buckets. There's a lot of projects listed, and most of them are kind of cross agency processes and projects. Um, the idea there is I think the director has shared before that the administration plans very quickly here to convene a cross agency um, similar task force to what um, you have been doing, but amongst the, the directors and staff um, to look at kind of cross agency solutions to, to workforce issues. And so a lot of the things that you see listed there will kind of be the task of that group. Um, and then the, the last kind of thing there listed is the um, workforce council recommendations, which is you. Um, so the intent there is for a substantial amount of that pot to be um, dedicated to this group and proposals that are generated from this group. Um, and so we know up to this point, um, you know, there has not been that kind of dedicated funding, so that's probably limited in some measure the, the recommendations that you're able to make um, and the realization of how um, they can be implemented. So um, it, again, it's the intent that a, a, a good amount of that money would be dedicated to, to this group. Um, moving on, um, system supports for the um, workforce. Um, you'll see that most of the projects listed there um, are um, assigned to DODD. Um, those are things that we advocated for um, in a reflection of kind of the conversations that we've had with many of you and the ideas that we saw um, through the survey. Um, so again, I they are just listed as very short titles, so I'd like to provide a little bit of additional context here today, but um, there's a, a lot more conversations to be had and um, partnering with you guys and kind of the development of a lot of these projects. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll run through um, some of the bigger ones here. Um, the first being, um, which hopefully everyone is familiar with, is that we want, we'd like to expand um, the virtual reality training for DSPs. Um, again, to, to help DSPs be ready for that day one on the job and then get some practical um, training that's in a safe environment. Um, the second one, um, DSP connector, um, the idea there is to help um, employees access um, needs that they might have outside of um, their typical job that employer might not typically help out with, but as we know, um, many of our providers have been doing during the pandemic. So things like finding childcare, um, accessing transportation, um, navigating public benefits, um, accessing medical services. Um, next, um, I will not spend much time on this, but ERNs, um, employer resource networks um, that we know um, some have had success with. Uh, the idea is to, to scale that and to allow some um, providers to utilize that through the ARPA funds. Uh, next is, um, again, I know it's been a topic um, here and with many of you, is the idea that um, we certainly needed to be doing um, a lot of targeted things for DSPs, but we cannot forget kind of the mid-level 
um, managers and as well as HR. Um, so the idea is here is to focus some training um, and technical assistance to those um, positions to help them kind of cultivate the culture of their DSPs and to you know help them with strategies to be able to recruit and retain those. Next is um, what we're calling um, some of these have some catchy titles. Some of them are rather just uh, technical, but um, DSP now um, that one is a kind of a broad idea with the idea of the you know the current climate of a lot of providers having to use overtime and being short on shifts and um, you know families experiencing call offs is uh, you know how can we help providers and both families and people so served manage those situations in kind of a quick turnaround and so is there an opportunity to bring um, you know a component of gig economy um, and is there an idea or a, you know, a possibility of just connecting providers to each other and staff to each other, um, allowing providers and both families to access that. And then the last one in that bucket that I wanted to touch on is uh, micro learning. And the idea there is, um, again, how can we help DSPs and kind of a, um, maybe not that critical is the right word, but um, instances where they need to access information quickly try to you know bring up the training that was in their mind that maybe they haven't had to access at this point but now it you know since something's come up so it could maybe dietary or behavioral and so the idea is here is you know an app solution that um, providers could access and then dsps in turn could pull up on their device and watch very short videos um, that are really targeted at a specific situation so you know you can navigate through the app search the app and find a an issue that you need to target at the time And so take a sip of water. Uh, next is uh, technology. Um, and so I think if you were on the webinar and a lot of the narrative, um, the other agencies, there's a lot of kind of systems work um, that I think we're kind of already been engaged in um, from DODD's perspective and a lot of the systems that we work on. So our ask in this area are really more around um, you could have bucketed a lot of these things with the topics that we just talked about, but you know, a lot of them are technology solutions. So, um, you know, for whatever reason, they're in the, the technology bucket. And so they're, they're looking at how can we leverage technology to support DSPs um, and additionally kind of furthering the technology first work. Um, so the two that I wanted to touch on there is the DSP support network. Um, the idea there is um, a, to have a statewide resource that would connect um, DSPs with various kind of specialists, um, similar to the the last thing we talked about, where there's there might be instances that a DSP you know needs to you know look back on previous training. There might be just things that are kind of outside of their purview, and maybe providers you know have capacity to answer those things on the fly. Maybe they don't, but it's you know putting a DSP in touch with a specialist kind of on demand that can help them again with dietary, behavioral um, things of that sort. And then the the last bucket um, from you know the four buckets is kind of that catch all, um, and so there's um, you know again um, DODD is in the DD systems pretty represented um, there. There's kind of four that I just want to touch on quickly. Um, the first being the family care connection. Um, that one is um, and again uh, Steve can maybe fill in a little bit if there's. Um, additional context or anything, but um, I know Steve and Ann being a part of some of the hotspot groups. Um, I think one of the things that they kind of brought back, and um, the rest of the you know the group members brought back was um, kind of the family need and the need to respond to families who have had a you know additionally a, a very very tough time these past two years and um, you know relying on their themselves as you know what we term natural supports. Um, but, you know, having that gap in service. Um, and so how can we look at, um, you know, utilizing targeted funds to, to support them and how they're they're having to, you know, supply their needs right now for their loved ones. Um, the next one um, or the next two are pretty similar. And, um, you know, there are there's been there's been the blueprint group, um, but then there's also been a lot of ask to look at 
um, how we reimburse um, providers in the system. And so in both of those instances, we're looking at contracting with outside expertise that can come in. Um, and I, I know one of the recommendations of the blueprint was to kind of do this work. And so we want to jump off with kind of both these topic areas of, you know, how are we as a system, you know, coming out of this crisis and coming out of those recommendations? Um, you know, how are we looking at that future state? How are we going to reimburse for um, waiver supports um, and adult day and employment? And then the last one I wanted to cover um, is around 14C subminimum wage. Um, that one is the concept there is, you know, we know that there's been, um, you know, whether things come to fruition or not, um, there's definitely been federal chatter. Um, and then a number of states have enacted through um, executive order or legislation around phasing out, eliminating, um, making substantial changes to how their state participates in 14C. And so the the idea with this pot of money is to do a lot of the things that you're probably familiar with um, around um, building capacity. Um, and so you know, we would look to extend um, the, the, sorry, the employer transformation grants and the building innovation service model grants. So those are things that we've granted out previously, and we've looked to kind of expand those, especially again, if there, if there is going to be change or there's that fear of change. Um, and then additionally, if that's where, um, you know, folks are choosing to move, um, we want to provide those kind of resources. Um, additionally, um, you know, the thought there is, you know, could we um, stand up or contract um, with a call center that could help people navigate some of this, um, especially when it pertains to their benefits and how um, change of service to employment um, or increased in, you know, wages can kind of um, adjust for those sort of benefits. Um, and then some peer mentorship models uh, of folks who have gone through sort of that transition and then further, you know, just additional training um, and additional kind of engagement on that um, transition and just a lot of the uncertainty out there. Um, so with that, um, that is, those are the big things. So I will um, kind of turn it back over to the group um, if there are specific questions or if there are feedback. Um, I'll additionally say we do have a webinar scheduled for Friday. Um, that'll be a little bit longer format, but we, we want to make sure that the kind of our entire community is up to speed of what ARPA is and kind of where we are in the process. But um, I will turn it back over to you, Jackie. Right, and could you make sure, uh, Jeremiah, that we have the link for that webinar that we can send out to everyone? Yep. All right, and Gary has his hand up. So I think I know the answer, but I just want to clarify because there's a lot of chatter. So direct payments to providers, is that only agency providers or does that also include independents? That would include independents. Um, it, do, it does or does not? Does. It would be very similar to the other lump sum payments okay. where we have where typically when you think of the increases that we've done in the lump sum payments that we've done, that kind of universe of HCBS is, would be the target. Okay, thank you, because the original communication was that it would not. So that probably was informal, but thank you. And then when would the payments be made? Yeah, so I, you know, our so the latest, the latest we possibly want is March of 2022, so we can get that additional 10. The idea is CMS approval, legislative approval. This is number one on our list to kind of get out. And so, um, you know, I think we know that, you know, as we've done with the lump sum payments, DODD has the capacity to turn these around um, really quick. So that would be um, our complete intent. Great, thank you. Renee has her hand up and then Kristen. For the agency payments, is that going to the agency as a whole or is there any guarantee that it will be passed down to the direct care worker? Thanks, Renee. Yeah, so the, the concept is kind of similar to what we've done before, where it's a direct payment to the provider. Um, and you know, as the narrative kind of says, it's the intent is that it's 
supposed to be supporting that kind of DSP workforce. Um, you know, we're using things like the DSP verification tool and things in the future. But for this, you know, it is a recognition that providers are drowning, that providers need these funds to kind of keep up. And I, you know, I don't think that we have a, a fear that th they're not going to be doing that. We we know that the, the market is demanding this. So. So yeah, it would be it would be that direct payment, um, but with a kind of a focus and intent that it's for supporting their DSPs and their workforce. So you, this, yeah, you do know that in the in the past they haven't done that effectively. Yeah, we certainly know that's a concern, and we know we've been engaging with um, many of the people on this phone and kind of a separate work group that's looked at kind of a verification tool that um, we have some survey results from and we'll kind of continue to use in the future. But again, this is in full recognition of kind of the, the current climate and getting that money out as quickly as possible. Hey, Renee, this is Debbie. Sorry, I just feel like I need to respond. Um, I think maybe there have been some providers who have not done that in the past. But I think that the majority of the providers have gone above and beyond. Um, I know I have a lot of members who are pulling from prior cash balances or foundations um, fundraising um, just to be able to pay their staff. And they're paying their staff right now a whole lot more than what they're reimbursed for. Um, and plus, on top of that, there were also additional costs with the pandemic that aren't taken in consideration with the rates when you start talking about, you know, PPE and all kinds of changes that need to be made. So I just, I believe that, you know, I know you may have had some experiences or people may have had certain situations where a provider may not have used the funds appropriately. I think right now though, if you talk about the majority and the vast majority of providers, they're drowning out there and they need this just to be able to survive. I, I didn't mean to say all providers. But I don't remember. Yeah, I, can I follow up on that as well? I kind of to piggy up back on what was just said. I thought the intent was to kind of pull agencies up who were drowning and that a message that this should go to DSPs is not. So the 4% increase was primarily for DSPs. This is just to, I thought, primarily pull up agencies who are drowning. That does not mean that it would be given to DSPs. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, so I, I want to step in here real quick. I think we're talking about semantics. This could go on for an hour. It's yeah. it's one and the same. We're in violent agreement. It is okay. to pay for what has already been paid for, which is going to our direct care workforce, which includes nursing and med techs and everybody else anyone working direct care, including managers, um, we're all paying significantly more than we're getting paid to do. We're running deficits. We've already passed this money on before it's gotten to us. I, I, we're all saying the same thing. It's intended for the DSPs. Some of us have just chosen to do it early. Yeah, I don't think it's the same message, Jason. And again, we could debate it, but if what was just said regarding the survey, that's different. And I, and I agree with you in a sense, but messaging the community that this is going to go for DSPs does not get to the DSPs the way we believe it should be. They're going to see this at, okay, they're not going to recognize you already gave it to them, or they're not going to recognize you already paid overtime, or they're not going to recognize that you gave them a week or two off because of a positive test. If this is in writing the way Jeremiah just said, they're going to recognize it. I'm going to get a bonus. It, OK, OK, well. I've already told my I've already told my staff that they're getting paid on average three dollars more per hour than everyone in the state. So they don't know. I, I guess it just depends on who's running the agency and how they communicate. But again, it's I don't think it's helpful on this call. It, it's intended for the workforce. Some of us have already paid it early. Okay, um, this is Teresa, and I'm with you, Gary. This came up on a call we had with Rivo. Jason, you were on that call. Rivo, I don't think he's on this today, but we we talked very clearly and specifically about the problems 
the system has had in the past when we've said something was going to go to DSP wages and it did not go to wages. We gave providers a lot of leeway about how they could use it. Some people provided health care for the first time. Some people provided a match in a retirement account. So it went to DSPs. Um, that's different than it going to wages. So if the message is about wages or a wage increase, um, that is going to be incredibly problematic uh, and and was in the past. We and for someone who you know regularly remind us reminds us that we don't want to throw good money after bad, <laughs> that I think we're not doing ourselves any favors if we don't have a consistent, clear message about what this is and what it isn't. Kristen, I think you were next. Yeah, just a quick question because it's a little off topic from this group, but Jeremiah, since you went through all the pieces, one thing I did notice as a difference between the narrative document that Medicaid put out and the spreadsheet document is a piece that actually was very interesting to me. The very last line on the narrative document talks about um, developing um, alternative decision making supports, but that is not actually on the spreadsheet and the numbers are also different. And so I'm wondering which one is correct and if that actually is part of the plan. Sorry, I'm just looking at that quickly. Your it's the DOD will provide planning grants to support the establishment. Is that yes. right? I don't Steve or Kim, I'm not sure if you're familiar but with that. At least in the proposal and the narrative that we put in there, it was around uh, the idea of expanding uh, supported decision making and supporting that across the state in various ways. Um, off the top of my head, I do not recall funding amounts or where it got put on spreadsheets and things like that, but that was uh, the narrative that that we proposed in that area. So we may have to go back and take a look at where the numbers lie for that. OK, I can follow up with you guys afterwards then, because um, I, I was especially curious, like I said, because the numbers are different between the narrative and the spreadsheet, so I wasn't sure which one might be right. So I'll follow up with you guys. And I had a question about that one, too, if I may. It, where Where is the gap? What 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 need is this part of the proposal trying to to fill exactly? <laughs> Can, can I speak up on that before the people who actually did the proposal can say that? Um, yeah. I would, I would say, um, so speaking, I would say speaking from two perspectives, the first one being a guardianship agency with a wait list and a lot of people who haven't even been referred to us because of a wait list. And just um, as someone who's really been advocating for alternatives to guardianship, I think we have a lot of individuals in the state who um, have advocacy needs and support needs that we would be um, using resources inappropriately by funneling them towards guardianship. And so if we can bring up more of these supports for people to be empowered to make decisions and to advocate for themselves without going down the guardianship route, I think we'll all see a lot of benefits from that. Again, it, it's not a workforce issue, but I think you know the ARPA funds are not just about workforce. I, I think it's absolutely a systems. And having actually just been at our National Guardianship Association conference this week, I can say um, Ohio has a lot of good theory on SDM, but we're kind of falling behind on putting into practice compared to other states. So I certainly think this would be a great investment if, if it turns out it was part of the final plan. Thanks, Kristen. That, that makes sense. Sir. Appreciate it. Also, I had a question about the, the 14C piece. Uh, obviously, this is a area that's important to many of our members. And just uh, if if we could say a few more words about its, its insertion into this plan. I know there's been discussion about legislation and everything else. And is there something else that we may be missing on this piece? Yeah, I don't think so from my perspective. I think that's, you know, the genesis of it is there's been a kind of trend in, in this direction and it's been something that we've um, 
provided grants to in the past. And so this would just provide that kind of expanded opportunity. Um, again, if something comes quickly or it doesn't, um, providing that opportunity to people. Any well, other? If there is any serious, it, I'm sorry, Jackie, if there no, is any no. serious movement uh, towards legislation, even here in Ohio, we would appreciate any stakeholder feedback. Uh, we can certainly assist in providing that. Yeah, that's Pete. I mean, I think it, everybody's aware of the sort of the magnitude in Ohio around that issue. We know that we know that Ohio APC with an E, Ohio APC with an E, this is one of their number one priorities. Uh, and they are um, working on a legislative approach to uh that issue so it, it is going to take all of us collectively to work through this because there are a lot of tentacles to that issue you know i mean you know it intimately so if if it happens or if you have to prepare for it i guess what i'm saying is that it's going to be best to do it in a, as best a coordination fashion as we can so does that mean you don't want to have it or you you do want it to happen. I'm not, I'm not getting a clear message here. Is that a question to me, Renee? To anybody, you or Peter? My, my, own, my approach uh, and ours, and there are differing opinions, certainly, and and opinions on both sides of the spectrum. Is it that it would take a lot of unwinding to get rid of 14C, and it it's best if we do that. Uh, it's it's just best to think that it's not simple. It can be done. It's not simple, and a lot of people will be affected in different ways, and and we just want to work together and prepare for it. If indeed it's moving forward, whether federally or there's push at the state level. Yeah. Have you got the opinion of people who are actually working under a fortune tree? What do they think about it? I'm sorry, we'll do what? The last part of that? The extra, the people who actually work under the yes. Have you got their opinion about it? Yeah, we've got uh, we've got enough data that we want to take a, a you know might merit a separate conversation at some point. We can certainly do that. Uh, we have enough data of those that have the certificates, and I think we have enough data that gives a sense of some sense of how many director this is gary the i'm on the this task force and i questioned it but i kept being repeatedly told by the task force chair that ooh dodd and the governor's office are in favor of the elimination of subminimum wage and i haven't had a chance to call you but i reckon i mean i'm I'll be honest, I, I understand the benefits. I know this is a workforce you know, issue, but this is here and on this. I understand that there are a number of individuals that would benefit that, it, that potentially the system is moving forward. And I'm not playing word games with you, I'm giving an honest answer. I also know there are some individuals out there uh, that are not making minimum wage, but that's not their individual goal. What they're doing is their individual goal and that sense of achievement and accomplishment and contribution every day is meaningful to them and there will be collateral damage. So I'm sensitive to, I'm sensitive on a human level to all, you know, all sides of it. Yep, me too. That's why the ARC hasn't taken a position. But I just wanted to point out, they clearly said that DODD, OOD and the governor's office fully support this initiative. And I, I because our organization has not taken a position, for everything you just said, I want to be able to clarify it with the chairs of this task force. Enough said, it's just a, 
Yeah, my position is just 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 what I said and what I what I have okay. said is that I, if it moves forward, we need to do it in the right way. OK, OK, uh, but I, I do understand. Uh, I understand the human element of it and both and certainly I hope uh, all sides of the equation. OK, well, they're they're telling legislators that you support the initiative. OK, and thanks for sharing. I'm just, you, thanks yeah, for just because sure. we've yeah. known each other forever, I want you to know yeah. what what the leaders of this task force are saying. OK, okay. thanks. Thank you. Any other Thank questions for Jeremiah or any other comments on the ARPA package as it now stands? Okay. We've pretty much covered um, our agenda for the day then. Um, is there anything else anyone wants to bring up for the, the good of the order, as they say? I didn't get that. Could you try again? Ooh, sorry, you tried to jump in there. Okay. So, uh, all right. I appreciate the good conversation today. There's a lot of ongoing work to happen here. So thank you for hanging in there, for generating good proposals, for giving good feedback and good ideas uh, to make things better in the field. Let me throw it back to the director for any final comments today. No, I look, it's best when we have all conversation um, sometimes it's really hard to be candid. It's hard to be candid in different environments. I'm sure that feedback, you know, will flow in different ways. Um, but the reality is what we have here is buckets and it's different ideas. And as Jeremiah said, there is a significant amount, a significant chunk of change uh, that we have titled that is going to workforce based on recommendations coming out of this committee. That's the way we've talked about it. But I mean, I, I see this as, as adaptable and flexible. We put some of these recommendations together based on a survey months and months ago. Things are changing all the time. We know this. So it's our hope that we can be adaptive and, and, and flexible as we move forward. And I'm hoping that this is one venue that this, this group of committed individuals to our system, you know, that it's one venue to have these conversations of how best to use it. You know, there are others. Yeah, thank you for that. Again, thank you for everyone. We'll be sending you all updated Outlook appointments. We'll make sure all the materials are in our notes and posted so that if you want to reference some of the things that um, Jeremiah in particularly was referencing, you have easy access to those materials. And as always, if you need any support information, feel free to reach out and we'll try to make sure that you all get connected to what you need. Thank you so much for today's meeting. Bye-bye.